Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Weaving Worlds. So, you've got yourself a fantasy world, and you want to stock it with the classic non-human races like elves, dwarves, and orcs. But before you start writing stories that feature these races, you should stop for a second and ask yourself whether you want to follow in lockstep with Tolkien or Dungeons and Dragons, or whether you want to put your own spin on things and make your fantasy races unique and memorable. Maybe I'm a little biased here, but hey, you saw the video title. But before I begin, I want to say that everything I'm about to discuss can apply just as well to alien species in a science fiction setting. It's just that science fiction settings are less likely to use the kinds of stereotypes I'm discussing here, and the goal of this video is to encourage people to explore new options, and to create fantasy worlds that only barely resemble the old standards. Start with the known, but make it your own. Creating a new fantasy race or species out of nothing can be a very daunting task. It's a skill you really have to practice to get good at, and one of the first things you have to realize about that skill is that no author or artist creates something out of nothing. Inspiration starts by reading a good book, examining a fascinating painting, or playing a fun game. The creative process then begins when an author says, okay, I enjoyed that but I bet it would be even better if I changed a few things, or if I added some interesting features that I saw in this other book or this other painting. In other words, if you want to create a unique fantasy setting, start with all of the traditional fantasy races and all of the fantasy stereotypes, but then change them. Add some new features to make them more complex. Steal some features from the other races to make them more surprising, and then create a history for them that defies the old conventions. Now, I realize that this advice might be a little too generalized to be helpful, so next I'll go over some of the classic fantasy stereotypes and give you some examples of how to switch things up. The Superior Race The Superior Race is like humanity, but better. They're more beautiful, more compassionate, and more magical. They have deeper emotions, or maybe they're more rational. They live longer, and maybe they understand the natural world better. Basically, this race has all of the traits that you, the author, think are good, and if they have any downsides, it's that whatever golden age or glory days this race has had happened long ago, and they've been in a melancholy slump ever since. The thing is, perfection is boring. While it might feel nice as the author to point to your superior fantasy race and say, my creations are so much better than humans, you guys, there's really no point to them. They can't grow as people if they don't make mistakes, and they can't change their opinions if they're always right about everything. So don't go that route, and instead, think about the downsides that all of those supposedly positive traits could bring along with them. Maybe your superior race always takes forever to do anything because they live for centuries and always have time to spare. Maybe they're so peaceful that they have trouble defending themselves against an aggressive neighbor. Maybe they've let their superiority go to their heads and so they've created a fascist society that enslaves the lesser races, including humans. The important thing to remember here is that if something seems perfect, chances are good that it's concealing something ugly. The Warrior Race The Warrior Race lives for battle. Its members are always hunting, fighting, or boasting about all the hunting and fighting they do. The only way to gain status is to beat up or kill whoever has more of it than you, or else you can raid a nearby peaceful village and steal all of their wealth and enslave all of their women. The warrior race is a fairly common sight in both fantasy and science fiction because it's an easy concept for us to grasp. Throughout the years, there have been many cultures that embrace a warrior mentality and idolize their warriors, and honestly every culture idolizes its warriors to one extent or another. However, when fleshing out a warrior race, it's important to recognize that not everyone in a warrior culture is a warrior. Not all of them go out on raids or fight in battles, although it can seem like they do as far as their neighbors are concerned. 
So instead of creating a warrior race that fights 24-7 even when they're at home, consider developing a society that looks like something else once the warriors come home and put their blades away. The Crafter Race the crafter race is the one that builds all the magnificent ruins that you can set your stories in. Maybe they developed lost technologies that the protagonists and the antagonists race to discover. Or maybe they built huge underground cities and roads that have become overrun by monsters. The crafters might still be around in some diminished capacity, or they might be completely extinct during the present day of your setting, leaving nothing behind but ruins and unanswered questions. Builder races are also based on real-life cultures, specifically the ones who built massive temples and monuments, but then went through a decline and died out. However, died out isn't really the most accurate way to describe the process. The people never really go away, they just change their habits and become a new people. So something interesting you might want to try is to have the human culture of your setting be descendants or offshoots of your builder race. Or maybe it's the other way around and the builders are offshoots of humans. Also, if your builder race is still around, you'll have some very fertile ground to create some old versus new conflicts. The Humble Race Other races have done great things and have big important ideas on how to run the world. The Humble Race doesn't care about any of that. They just want to be left alone on their small parcel of land where they can live their lives in peace. However, when fate or some ancient villains come knocking, the humble race will tighten their suspenders and show the world just how powerful and important they can be. Unlike the superior race, the humble race has a lot of storytelling potential built in. Everything starts quiet, something happens, and now the humble become the heroes. I suppose this is why a lot of authors make humans the humble race, although calling humans humble is a bit of wishful thinking if you ask me. Still, it's important to remember that just like the superior race, a people that's nothing but humble is unrealistic. Maybe their culture encourages humble thinking, but they have some ambitious members who want something more. Maybe the only reason they're humble is because they were brought low by an ancient conflict, and if they ever have a chance to rise again, they'll be just as tyrannical as any other race. The Whimsical Race the Whimsical Race is the designated comic relief. When the going gets tough, someone from the Whimsical Race will tell a joke or get into a silly mix-up and lighten the mood a little. If the protagonists visit the Whimsical Race, that whole section of your story will be one long comedy routine. When you create a Whimsical Race, you need to be very careful about avoiding real-life racism and stereotyping. Jar Jar Binks is infamous for a lot of reasons, but the most problematic reason is that he talks like he's a black slave in a minstrel show. I mean, C-3PO sounds like a snooty English butler, but that's a stock character in English comedies, rather than a celebration of the disenfranchisement of an entire group of people. My suggestion is that if you create a joke fantasy race, have that race be the ones telling the jokes and not just be the butt of jokes. The Outcast Race This race has no homeland, or at least not one that's anywhere close by. Instead, they wander between towns or else live in segregated ghettos away from the majority population. Wherever they go, they have to deal with scorn, prejudice, and hatred, and whatever special qualities they have only makes the locals more suspicious. Racism is a big part of the outcast race's characterization, and as such, it's important in this case, too, to be very careful about how you present them. If you portray the outcasts as being completely deserving of their negative reputation, then you are definitely being racist. On the other hand, if the outcasts are all perfectly angelic and every last man, woman, and child is good and noble and decent, then you may be perpetuating some positive, yet equally dismissive stereotypes. Either way, or even if your portrayal falls somewhere in the middle, you should expect at least some of your audience to be vocally upset with you. The Villain Race The villain race is bad to the bone. They were born evil, either because of the method of their creation, or because dark 
gods influence their minds to force them to be constantly vicious, hateful, stupid, and uncivilized. The protagonists could slaughter as many members of the villain race as they come across, because doing so will always make the world a better place. So yeah, the idea that dark-skinned ugly pagans are irredeemably evil is problematic from top to bottom, at least if you ask me. And it should be noted that this concept first appeared in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s when open and supposedly scientific racism was the norm. The fact that some fantasy media still features unavoidably evil humanoid races seems like an anachronism we could really do without at this point, and I strongly encourage anyone listening to avoid perpetuating these stereotypes. You can still feature a group of foreign invaders in your setting that the protagonists have to heroically stand against, but just make sure that there's more to their society than just killing and raping and pillaging. A group of people can do evil things without being a simplistically evil culture. The Mastermind Race the masterminds are like the villain race, but unlike the villains, the masterminds can create conspiracies, manipulate other races to fight amongst themselves, and otherwise craft cunning and dastardly plans that will allow them to one day rule the world. The mastermind race is at least an improvement over the savage stupidity of a villain race, but you should still be careful about how you present them. The idea that a whole race could be part of a seditious conspiracy sounds a lot like real-life anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, so bear that in mind if your mastermind race starts to infiltrate cities full of unsuspecting victims. A mastermind race is more acceptable than a villain race because at least they have a society they want to expand, and they have intelligence and agency over their own actions, but just make sure that their goals and their methods don't sound like they came from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Regionalism and Diversity The single best thing you can do to make sure your fantasy races are more interesting and unique than the stock elves and dwarves you always come across is to keep in mind that each race represents a collective of nations and cultures and not just a single culture per group. That's how it works in real life. Every town and city is a little bit different from every other town and city, even if they all belong to the same region or the same nation. By emphasizing regionalism and diversity in your setting, you can use fantasy races or science fiction species to point out that race is often one of the smallest components that contributes to an individual's personality. Thanks for joining me again for today's journey into weaving worlds. Please like, share, and subscribe because that raises my visibility here on YouTube. Check out my other stuff if you have some time, support me on Patreon if you have some money, and I hope we'll see you again for the next video.